Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you'll learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secured retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in, because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. I'm the Big Mike, Mike Zlotnik. Today it is my distinct pleasure and a, privilege, and a privilege to welcome Mark Jackson, also known as MJ, uh, not to confuse with the famous basketball player, Michael Jackson, not Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson wasn't a basketball player. He was a, a singer, a pop star, Michael Jordan. See, <laughs> I, uh, I have problems here, but you have a certainly famous name. And, and my guess is you, you, you're probably just as famous as... Um, Michael Jackson and uh, Michael Jordan. Hi, MJ. Hey, Mike. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Outstanding. Enjoying uh, just a beautiful day in South Carolina today. It's nice and warm and sunny. And uh, just glad to have the opportunity to come and share with your folks. So thank you for the wonderful invitation. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your time. And I appreciate you coming on the podcast. So uh, we met through Freedom Founders, and um, it's a great mastermind. Uh, met many great, great people through that group. So we chatted. Yeah. We've done some deals together as well. I remember we did a while back. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Tell, tell the audience a couple of words about uh, you. Uh, I know you are a great athlete. That, that I know. So you run marathons, triathlons, and you have a great, great valuation uh, company business. Uh, so you you founded an appraisal company and you have great software. So to talk a little bit about you, your family, and a couple of words about your business. Oh, absolutely. And again, Mike, thanks for having me on. I, first and foremost, uh, have a, a tremendous faith walk. And after that, a very beautiful wife, very fortunate to uh, be married for a number of years now. Five children and two grandchildren. And, and then still, again, as you say, just enjoying the fullness of life, have completed uh, my second Ironman in 2018, and that was quite a joy, quite an experience, and looking forward to doing more of those. But uh, a number of years ago was buying my first home, and at the closing table discovered the appraisal. And so it was like divine intervention. It was understanding the math that went behind it, the technology behind it, the software behind it, and uh, just the premise, being in a situation of helping the banks determine what is the value of a property so that their position would be secure in any type of lending uh, transaction, mortgage, so on and so forth. And I uh, decided to go after that big time, went to appraisal school, started my own company, was fortunate enough to build a nice size firm and sold that in 2004 after about five years. Then got into the information business. A number of people in the real estate space wanted to know how I could evaluate property or how they could evaluate property the same way as an investing appraiser did so that we could actually determine not just what the house was worth, but what was the best acquisition value? How much should you pay for that real estate? And then simultaneously determining what is the actual repair value? What can you remarket it for down the road? So I've had a lot of success with investor comps, formerly investor comps online. We, we dropped the online kind of like Federal Express became FedEx and have just enjoyed having the opportunity to share with investors, not just domestically, but also internationally, as they look to add, make sure that they make a profit when they buy their real estate. So that's a little bit about me, Mike. And anything else I can do as we share this time together to help your folks out, it is absolutely my pleasure, without a doubt. MJ, this is great. Uh, you're certainly blessed with kids and grandkids and beautiful family, so that's the most important thing. And uh, yeah. I wanted to uh, say that I just know you personally, you're such a heart of gold, So, and you have a wonderful family. So I appreciate uh, you, and then uh, let's talk a little bit about your business. Uh, so investorcomps.com, right? That's the website, investorcomps.com. That is correct. So what my background as a real estate appraiser uh, we started out basically, you know, you go knock on the door. It's like, Mr. Loan Officer, Mr. Loan Officer, can I please get some of your appraisal business, please? And that was back in the early 2000s. 
And what happens over time is your loan officers actually introduce you to other clients. And it just so happened, I was introduced to a number of investors. And they needed us to come in, analyze their deals that they were going to do uh, based on the profits they, they had the intent to extract out. There's a lot of flips on these deals. And so my, my take was different. I didn't just go in and get three comps and three listings and say, okay, here's what the value is. I would come back to those investors and I would say, you know, this, this property has a certain value, but as an investment deal, it's really not right because of the functional obsolescence that exists in the home. It's, it's actually not the right location because there's other building permits that are taking place as a result of some of the analysis we were doing on the valuation side in the market area. Uh, so we actually helped a lot of investors save money on deals that they otherwise would have done but would have lost all the profit in it. And that's what really created uh, this dynamic of investor comps where we could actually help investors in what became all the major market areas in the country do deals and do them the right way, not just do any deal. So that was really the fun and the impetus for creating investor comps so that individuals like your clients, my clients, I have a great um, person, uh, Joanne Musa, and she actually helps people buy uh, tax deeds and tax certificates. And overwhelmingly, they still are able to use investor comps to actually pull up a property look at what the overall market value is on that. So should they decide to redeem those certificates or tax deeds, they'll know how much value they have in that property so that they should decide to foreclose on it, maybe um, remarket it as a wholesale, or even get ready to fix it up and do a flip on it. They know the value of that property against the tax deed or certificate that they've acquired uh, at the courthouse steps or beyond. So using valuation data on these homes, single family residential is a key component rather than relying on just a, a free website to tell you what might be some estimate of what the value is. Individuals can actually go in, use investor comps, either as a one-off report or as a subscription and look at each and every transaction that they're considering buying and knowing that they're gonna make a profit when they buy. That's exactly what investor comps and our team allows uh, individuals to do. So MJ, this is brilliant. Uh, I certainly can tell the difference between just uh, uh, automated valuation tool and uh, what, what you provide. It sounds to me that you have a very different product. This is not product, this is not Zillow, this gives you a price. This is a tool for investors to be mm -hmm. able to evaluate the property and be able to make a decision. And as the yeah. good old expression says, you buy, you make the money on the buy, not the sell. Because you exactly. buy. So you, you, your product or your service helps uh, folks understand the value of the uh, deal before they buy it. And then they're getting kind of, um, uh, I guess, investor side of the equation, uh, making sure that they're getting it at a good price rather than just uh, compared to uh, to Zillow. So one quick question. Is yes. your software at the investorcoms.com, is it at like an AV, AVM uh, is it, or AVS, automated valuation system, automated valuation tool, or whatever you call it, or automated valuation software, or is, is this a service uh, with uh, you or some of your team members adding some additional analysis to the, uh, to the query? Actually, it's uh, all of the above. At Investor Comps, what a person's able to do, we've created a specific algorithm. So when you go in, you've got the address of the property you're looking at, or maybe you have the parcel ID. Maybe you just had a conversation and you have the owner's name of the property and not even the address. So you can actually look up our clients in a variety of ways, a piece of real estate. Again, I mentioned it was either by the address by the tax ID, a lot of times in the newspaper for foreclosures and things of that nature, houses are listed just by the tax ID, not by the address because they don't want to get, just give away the information to somebody go knock on the door. Or you may just have a conversation with someone and you know their name and they're talking about their situation, but they didn't mention the address of the home. So you have a number of ways you can go and find that piece of real estate. 
And here's the beautiful part. Once you've identified it, you're going to be able to see who the title holder is. And after that, you're going to have the legal description. Other information you'll have will be something like the census tract. Now you can look at that census tract and see any numbers of the data. What's the average education level of people in that market area? How far do they travel to work? What is their income level? How many people are in the household per average in that neighborhood? Beyond that, you're able to see the transaction history. What did that person actually pay for that house back in 2015, 2004, 1998? What was the mortgage they took out? The principal balance of that mortgage. Who was the lender? Was it an FHA loan or was it a conventional loan? There's a wealth of information that we as investors, a fund like yours, or people that are actually looking to do a fix and a flip, or even note buyers that need to understand the LPB, excuse me, the, um, the, oh, pardon me, the OPB, the Outstanding Principal Balance. There, we help investors in every genre of real estate because at some point, regardless of what type of deal you're doing, you're going to have to ask yourself, how much should I pay for this property and what can I remarket it for? And that's what Investor Comps does, not only through the data, but also through our support desk. So you can actually submit, hey, I got this project. It's in St. Louis, and I'm trying to figure out what I should pay for this house. Here's some of the information. Can you help me out? Well, yes, we help those clients figure those things out. Yeah, this is this is a great this is a great tool and a great service. I I, I appreciate it so much being um, a lender on some of these deals. Um, and m most of the folks who are local, they may know all the great dynamics of their own area, but the data you provide enhances their own decisions. Some of them yes. could already have a decent idea what they could pay for it, and some could use a little bit of your data, especially if they're going in the part of town they're not as familiar with, uh, or, or even even their neck of the woods. Uh, it still sounds like a very valuable tool. So oh, one, uh, one question, um, and, and help me, uh, educate me a little bit and the audience. So when the market conditions change, and the reason I'm saying this is we're in the fall of 2018. There is a degree of volatility out there and a degree yeah. of nervousness. But we've been running well for too long. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, as they say, uh, I don't know if you ever watched uh, Star Trek. Um, okay. I'm a, I'm a big track, uh, Trekkie fan. Okay. <laughs> there was this character Q, and he talks to Picard, and he says, all good things must come to an end before he's about to destroy humanity. This is, again, this is sci-fi. Sure, sure, all sure. good things must come to an end. So all I'm saying is uh, all great runs come to an end sooner or later. Yes. Whether yes. it's going to happen now or we're going to re recoup, re re rebalance, and run again for another year, who knows? Right. But certainly uh, the run is, 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 is uh, the bulls are tied, let me put it this way. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. It. They've been running too yeah. long and too hard. So, uh -huh. well, n l let's now look a little bit about what happens. And this has happened in the past when the market crashed and then it was rebounding. The same concept applies. Yeah. So when the market conditions change, and sometimes they change rapidly, they don't change overnight, but they change rapidly, rapidly in real estate. Yeah. How do service like this uh, is able to uh, adjust. And I'll give you some examples. There are already rapid changes. So if you look at certain portion of condos in Miami or New York City, where I live, the condos, mm -hmm. especially the high end, has taken a beating and sometimes significant beating. And you, you, you could see annual changes of 20%, for, sometimes even more, very significant uh, adjustments to the prices. Mm -hmm. So how does a tool uh, like investorcomps.com adjusts to rapidly changing market conditions. Right, well the beautiful part about it is this, Mike, because we abstract directly from the municipality. We're seeing the transactions literally in real time. Most municipalities across the country will update within 30 days. So as soon as a transaction happens, within 28 to 30 days, we have that data available to show. Now I'll do it kind of in reverse order. Back in 2007, 2008, 2009, when we were doing transactions, what would happen initially is we started seeing foreclosures. Then 
we started seeing in 2009, 2010, 2011, all these transactions where entities, LLCs, um, uh, custodians were buying from the banks. So if I had a property I was looking up in a residential neighborhood, even condos in Atlanta or in the Florida market around Tampa, uh, in Dallas, what you would see is rather than 20 comps with a transaction between MJ and Big Mike, you would see ABC Real Estate, Acme Investing, um, all these different entities that were buying from the banks and maybe only a handful, if at all, out of 20 comparables, an arm's length transaction. Well, fortunately, in 2012, 2013, 2014, all that transition to be more arm's length transactions, length transactions and far fewer uh, ent entities buying from the bank. Now today, overwhelmingly, when you're looking at transactions, it's predominantly arm's length. There's very, very few foreclosures, very, very few transactions that are from HUD or from the banks. However, today, the exact same cycle is starting to take place. You're starting to see fewer transactions that are arm's length, just, you know, one, uh, somebody buying from a subdivision or, you know, Mike buying from uh, MJ, that type of thing. And you're seeing not only that, but fewer sales that are happening so fast. So if I'm looking at a report today, where in, let's just say in June of this year, I might, well, after 30 days, see three to four transactions in June, three to four transactions in May, a host of transactions in April, all right there, uh, bunched together. Now I'll, I'll look up a property, okay? And this is the key indicator. It's October as we're doing this time together. I'll see two transactions in September, one transaction, two transactions in August. And then the comparables will then maybe go all the way back to January of this year. So based on the market area, not all market areas, but this is your key indicator, using investor comps, now you're seeing a broader spread, longer marketing time for the sales that are actually taking place. That is a huge key indicator in terms that a market is changing. Now you're not gonna see it everywhere. In some cases, you won't see a sale for September and August or July. The first transaction is now June and May, even though you're looking up something in October. Those are the types of key indicators to see, all right, something's changing in this particular market area. Let me pay close attention because I may not be, I may have to add more holding costs to the deal that I'm doing. I may have to sell on price, reduce this, the actual repair value that I'm going to sell for just so that I can move that transaction quickly. That's what having data from investor comps allows you to do, not to mention the support we give folks to be able to look at transactions in the way I just described. Well, I appreciate it. that was a lot of interesting information, and uh, I'm I'm just gonna see if I if I understood this correctly. So um, rapid, well, it's not rapidly, but the the changing uh, data is obviously impacting what the current value is. But you're using the data from three months ago, from six months ago. So the question is this: um, when you produce yeah. reports, do you have an adjustments or some kind of you know red flag, yellow flag indicators? that says uh, the data is there, but we are seeing some kind of pattern in the zip code or in the city that is um, uh, pointing towards changing market. So some kind of leading, I don't know if it's a leading indicator because all, all the data is, 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 is trailing data, uh, but the point is, uh, are there enough, let's just call them leading indicators in the potential adjustments, um, even though it's a trailing data, but it's a leading indicator. Right. So we have on a, yeah, so we have a couple of pie graphs and charts on our reports. One of them in particular shows uh, the, the dollar amount of the transaction. So you'll see uh, it, if, the, if the average transaction is $110,000, just as an example, that'll have a certain percentage. Um, if the transactions are you know, between one hundred and $105,000, you'll see a certain percentage in that pie chart. We're looking at those. Well, as we've got our investors, they're doing deals 
and they're pulling their investor accounts reports, they can see how many transactions are selling at the top of the market and how quickly. Well, when that starts, when that pie chart starts to shift, where the high highest sale isn't the most prevalent, but now it's the second tier sale or the third tier sale that is the most prevalent. That's a key indicator that markets are shifting, and all that data is right on the investor comp report. That's great. I mean, th this is this is certainly uh, very useful, and um, it is uh, potentially. Um predictive or uh, the, the, the days in the market in different price ranges is, is a big deal uh, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, maybe as, as long as, 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 as well as many other um, data indicators, but many investors, and again, we work with many of them, they enter right. into transactions uh, using some local CMA or comps and they're not really using the data uh, that is uh, sort of, fresh and, 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 and predictive. Uh, it's a right. little bit of a concern, especially when the, um, the transaction, uh, transaction size is well above the average in a given market, sort of the high right. end market. Uh, by the way, this is where we, we've seen, and not, but not just us, but a lot of people have seen softening uh, due to rising interest rates. The more expensive properties are much more sensitive to the cost of uh, money. To the cost of money, yeah. And even too, Mike, one of the things that we teach and share in investor comps and the data allows you to see is, hey, is my market shifting away from short-term transactions and shifting towards more long-term transactions where you're a landlord, you're holding a property for passive income? And if I could share one nugget on that, when you're looking at the investor comps reports and the buyers and sellers on the transaction, because you can, like I said, you can see exactly who they are. When you see the buyer has a mailing address right there on the investor comps report that is different from the subject property, bam, you automatically know that this is an entity or person that is holding this property as a landlord, as an investment. Right. So now you can actually, if you want, you want to, you want to follow that new bull. If that bull. It's slowing down and getting more position to kind of go hibernate and turn into a bear. You can see that very readily on your investor comps report because, again, remember we're talking about arm's length transactions versus investor transactions. Well, you're seeing that it's one thing to actually see the buyers and sellers, but when you can see that they're an absentee buyer or someone that's actually out of market, you can clearly immediately be ahead of the curve start modifying and shifting your own investing business to passive income rather than so focused on short term so that you're not getting caught with a property that's going to be on the books for a long period of time when your intent was just to sell it very, very quickly. Or at least you're in a position where now you know you've got to have a dual exit strategy and not just get it, fix it, and sell it. Maybe get it, fix it, keep it for a little while then sell it. That's what the kind of data we have in investor comps allows investors to be able to do and do very, very easily. Yeah, this is, this is, this is very helpful. I, I, I did want to comment on a couple of the points you made. So what you're calling arm's length is really a transaction that is um, between sort of non-incorporated entities, just generally from, from MJ to Big Mike. It's basically yeah. two, people, two, two people and it is, um, likely to be, uh, you know, owner ock. It is possible to be an investment property. Uh, people certainly buy in their own names uh, under the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac uh, investor uh, products. Yeah. Uh, so there's no argument. It could be uh, owner occupied or could be a, um, an investment property. The, but, but on the other side that you mentioned, the distressed transactions, uh, let's just call them, uh, well, during the days of the crisis, the banks were selling uh, where there were short sales and there mm -hmm. would be transfers into you know, buying LLC. Most of these transactions or virtually all of them with, with, with a small exception during the short sale, what I've seen is sure. people are buying in their own name to get an approval to make it look like it was an investor because the banks were predisposed. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> there was all kinds of biases. <laughs> kinds uh, I, I don't know how to call it, but uh, certainly bank approvals were somehow a little bit more uh, favorite to people who were buying in personal name than an entity. It, it looked like all those yeah. vultures trying to um, steal a property away from the bank. 
Uh, right, exactly. Yeah, these are very good points, and, and knowing the difference is very helpful to um, understand what's happening in the market conditions. Interesting point you also mentioned, and I wanted to speak a little bit more on this, dual exit strategy. So uh, as a you know as a lender on a lot of the uh, turnkey fix and flip projects, I, I love the strategy because the turnkey range, and again, th this appears to be the hottest range around the country. We're calling it turnkey range. There's no specific number, but it's typically anywhere on the lower end, just say 70, 80,000 on the high end to 100, and, you know, 120 up to, you know, 170, 180 on new construction, 185. But if it's a yeah. you know, property, it doesn't go that high. So these type of properties generate pretty good cash and cash. And they do like the strategy. If you get in and you can't get out at the price you want, you can at least rent it at a good rent to value ratio. So right. another interesting, a very quick point. We, we sort of, you know, running a little bit short on time, but... Uh, <laughs> Do you have any, because I've had discussions with a number of folks who do short-term rentals. And yeah. uh, I don't know if, you, if you have any, any play in that space, if you, you're helping investors uh, with uh, valuation of these properties. And what mm -hmm. I've seen has been a pretty interesting trend. Some municipalities fight it, some support it. Just, uh, just any comments on this? You, you, no, you may not need to have any specific short-term rental play but it would be you know it's one of those things that, that i just just came across so i wanted to quickly ask the question absolutely so we just look at a deal in sarasota florida and there's a primary residence on the front of the lot and then this particular home has a pool and a lanai with the screening over it and then there was a secondary residence built behind it the two of the siblings two sisters built this extra residence two bedroom two bath behind the primary residence so they could look after their parents and so now the parents have passed on and they've been there for a few more years and now they're ready to transition out. The beautiful part about the analysis on this deal as it specifically relates to long-term or short-term rentals, Airbnb, HomeAway, stuff like that, is that we're looking at the primary residence as a rental, pure rental property. And then we're looking at the secondary residence specifically for the purpose of doing Airbnb short-term rentals. The unique analysis that we did on it was that the county is very welcoming and doesn't have any strict regulations on doing Airbnb, and that's to our benefit, so we're pursuing this deal. Had the property been in the city of Sarasota, they have a number of registration components, additional taxes, almost to the point where, yes, they're supervising it, but they're making it a little bit challenging to do it, whereas the county uh, doesn't really go, not so much they don't care one way or the other, you still have to register, but it's not as much of a tax burden or restrictions to do it. So we look at both of those and we help people because the analysis on buying that type of property from a valuation perspective with two residences on a half acre lot is very different from uh, doing it just for the purpose of having maybe both properties being long-term rentals as compared to one being the, the passive income and the other one being more of an aggressive income. And then what are the actual valuations when it comes to, uh, pardon me, what are the actual totals when you're looking at what kind of income you can make on those? And Sarasota is a beautiful place to do it because folks want to come there in the wintertime, folks want to come there in the summertime. It's right near the beach, so on and so forth. So we're really excited about doing this one. The valuation is a little bit different in terms of what we consider to be our offer price, what we're willing to pay for it, and the long-term value on it as well. So. It's a lot of fun looking at these. That's a great question, Mike, because we're seeing more and more of it, and it really depends on the municipality that you're getting engaged with as to how you go forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that that, that, that example uh, because it, I see it in you know in some some markets and, and some some folks have come to us uh, with files and and it's interesting uh, conversation uh, when. Um, you potentially looking to flip it, and then you got to have consideration: can you do a, a long-term rental as an alternative? And then you ask the follow-up question: can this be a strong short-term rental? Because uh, yep. some municipalities are phenomenal for this, and and and, and all, there's also another subsection who actually does short-term rentals. Is it mostly vacation, or some cities um, have traveling business people, traveling nurses, and whatnot, and they prefer those type of property versus you know hotels? So. There you go. There you go. 
Uh, MJ, I, I greatly appreciate your, your wisdom and your insight. This has been uh, phenomenal. Very interesting. Um, just for the audience, one more time, it's investorcomps.com. Uh, I know MJ personally. He's a true servant in heart. He's a wonderful person, and he's got a great business. So uh, if you are flipping houses or even holding uh, long-term or short-term deals, uh, it's it's a good tool to to check out and to you know potentially see if it makes sense for you. So there you go, good stuff. Uh, any There's other parting any other parting thoughts? Any other words? Oh, yeah. You have a good book. I, mean, I always say you know again you want to make a profit when you buy. Um, we have other information at Investor Comps. We actually do a couple of trainings every year. Those are at the end of October and the end of April. So just check out those training events. We usually do an investor summit. And then a specialized event, either the ABCs of fixing and flipping or just some foreclosure investing as well. We do a mastermind cruise every summer. We're going uh, in July of 2019. And then pretty much every summer where we have a group of people like-minded come together to share concepts and ideas for everyone to be successful together and enjoy a nice vacation as well. Uh, Overwhelmingly, the book I'm reading now and really, really enjoying is The uh, Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs by Hal Elrod. It is a great way to actually restart uh, some of your lifestyle practices, both personally and business, and it's been very, very rewarding to me, and I I recommend it highly. It's uh, The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs by Hal Elrod. Great book and highly recommend it, uh, again, just for your own personal development as well as your business development. And, Mike, thank you for having me on. I I really can't thank you enough, and I know that I'm going to reciprocate and have you on uh, my podcast as well. MJ, I very much appreciate your wisdom and, and your sharing and, and your thoughts. And is there any other website except for investorcomps.com? Uh, just, just trying to see if there's any other way if, if folks wanted to reach out to you. I know you have the crews and other ones, or they can just go to investorcomps.com and you have links to everything else. And every links to everything, yes. Yeah, plenty of data there. And again, we, we, we do provide the best real estate valuation data, but we also are there to support investors and also give them good training. So again, Mike, thank you for having me. And thank you for allowing me to share information so folks can catch up with me. Thank you, MJ. Thank you kindly. And um, we're out of time. Uh, Have a wonderful day. And uh, I'll speak with you soon. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to bigmikefun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike Zlotnick. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.